Right. Dear President, dear Jeff, dear Mark, and dear Clara, all very popular people in this school. It's a great pleasure and honor, really, to have you here with us, spending that session at ESCP Europe. And ESCP Europe, of course, is the uh, only, I don't know if you know this, pan-European business school. And of course, it's the best place where you can learn management. And ESCP Europe, in uh, this very building, was uh, created by Jean-Baptiste Say, an economist and a businessman who coined, for the very first time, the concept of entrepreneur. So the concept of entrepreneur is not just a French word went, that went into English, but it is clearly something that is part here of the DNA of the school. And uh, the distinctive feature of this uh, business school is that of course, it's excellence in teaching, in teaching business skills, but also in developing leadership in multicultural contexts in this global world. And I know this is very dear to you. I think you once said that to be a friend, to, to be a good friend in, in business, you'd better be able to be with the other person's perspective. And that's exactly the strategy of the school, preparing students and future leaders to operate in that multicultural environment. This is what we do, and of course, in addressing uh, students and participants this morning, this is not just addressing a, a French setting, but it's addressing a truly international and European uh, population and sample of uh, students. As the chairman and CEO of uh, GE, you have a special relationship with education and research. And we are very, very proud when you are talking about today, when you're going to be talking to our master's students, on the very day, I don't know if Clara organized it that way, on the very day that patent, I need to read the number, 223898, which was the patent that was received by Thomas Edison on this very day, anniversary day, 1880, for a so-called electric lamp. And that electric lamp and the company that went with it became part of the General Electric Company 12 years after I was said. And this is uh, maybe just more than a nod uh, to uh, the audience. Also, our two institutions, ESCP Europe and uh, GE, were born in the 19th century. But of course, we are facing the grand challenges of this world, and especially the digital one. Just before you're going to uh, address this uh, honorable assembly, and just before this uh, very expected uh, exchange happens, I would like that the uh, president of the uh, ESCP Europe uh, Business School Foundation president, uh, Patrick Gounel, the dean for faculty, Beatrice Collin, and myself, we are very proud and pleased to confer on Jeffrey Robert Emelt the title and rank of Honorary Professor at ESCP Europe Business School. Great to be here. Uh, all of you have uh, studied hard and, and uh, paid for tuition to get your degree. I've been here five minutes and I already have one. So <laughs> I've been saying, <laughs> you're doing something wrong or I'm doing something right. So uh, it's, it's great, to, uh, uh, great to be with you. I'll, I'll make just a few comments about the world and uh, some of the innovations in the world. And, but what's really always the most fun 
is to get questions and talk about anything uh, you want to talk about. I, I think uh, maybe start with myself. So I've worked with GE for 33 years. I was a uh, math and physics major in college. I, I, I uh, received a master's in business like, like you, and I joined GE in 1982. And I spent my career, early career, I was in uh, sales and product management, uh, selling plastics in the automotive industry. So my first job was getting uh, uh, high temperature plastics specified into instrument panels, uh, calling on car companies in Detroit. And then I kind of grew my career in GE's plastics business. Uh, I worked in our appliance business for three or four years. Uh, then I ran our plastics business later in my career. I ran our healthcare business for five years and I became CEO in 2001. So that's kind of my uh, history and background. I always worked in global businesses my whole career. Uh, so I had great uh, comfort, let's say, doing business around the world. I joined you in 1982. G was 80% uh, in the US and I became CEO in 2001 and we were 70% inside the US. And in 2016, we'll be almost 70% outside the United States. So that's, in one generation, shows you how the world changes and how companies change. Uh, GE is, uh, as, a, as the professor said, is uh, about 140 years old in some iteration. It was, uh, uh, General Electric came together uh, really as a combination of several companies, but, but its genesis goes to the 1870s. And today we're, $130 billion kind of high-tech industrial company. We do business in 175 countries around the world. We invest about 6% of our revenue back into R&D. Uh, we're one of the big patent filers and one of the big technology companies uh, of the world. And we're uh, very big in France. So we've, we've had a presence in this country and in Europe for uh, a long time. So that's really maybe a little bit about myself, a little bit about the company. And now let's just maybe talk a little bit about uh, the world. You are going to be graduating or studying at an incredible time. Uh, in some ways, I was lucky. When I uh, graduated in 1982, uh, it was relatively a, a world of peace. Uh, there were no fundamental uh, wars going on. Uh, if you were an American business person at that time, uh, the US was the largest economy, fastest growth economy. And really, for 25 years, the U.S. economy grew uh, more than 4% a year with no inflation. Uh, it was a relatively tranquil uh, time of economic uh, development. In Europe, uh, they were going through unification, maybe a little bit more uh, turbulence in Europe. Uh, but basically, China was coming on the scene. So my first trip to China was 1986. So, you know, to see the growth in China. So relatively tranquil, le growth led by the developed world. That was the last uh, 25 years. That's not today. Today, we live in a time period of just slow growth and volatility, massive volatility. I've never seen uh, in my uh, career uh, as much uh, volatility as we have today. Uh, natural resource pricing, geopolitical unrest, populism. I mean, I could go down the list. And, there's no signs that that's going to change uh, uh, anytime soon. So I begin my story of like, how do you run a company uh, like ours in a time of great uh, volatility where very little can be predicted, right? So, uh, you know, the first thing I would say is that, you know, as you study uh, in school, conglomerates like GE go in and out of favor. But this is a great time to be a conglomerate, right? Because not everything's going to work, but we have a lot of parts of the company uh, that are doing great in this cycle. And diversification really gives us the advantage to take advantage or to, to make investments that other people uh, can't make uh, during times of volatility. So I, I would actually argue that this, uh, in a volatile world, it's it's good to be able to have diversity of both markets, of industries, and of regions as you look at uh, uh, the time we're in. I, I became CEO in 2001. The 9-11 tragedy happened right after that. Uh, for the next four years, if you were in the commercial aviation business, like companies like Safran or like GE, those were terrible years. I can't even tell you how bad it was. 
Now our aircraft engines business has a $150 billion backlog. It's uh, five times bigger today uh, in profit than it was in 2004. Other parts of GE paid for the aviation business during that cycle. Today, our oil and gas, gas business, as you can imagine, is quite difficult. Uh, but it's a great time to be investing in oil and gas assets if you believe in this uh, uh, industry for the long term. So the ability to, to traverse various regions and various uh, industries makes diversification a real asset in uh, uh, the world we live in today. The other thing I try to do with our team is I, I believe in self-help when you run a company. That basically if you have no tailwind, you have to create your own tailwind. So if I was standing in front of GE people uh, right now, what I would say is uh, don't read the newspaper or watch TV. You can't do anything about the taxi strike in Paris, about the price of oil, about what's happening in the Middle East. Focus on what you can control. And uh, the company, from a self-help standpoint, we've got productivity programs. We've got surplus cash. We've got the ability to, to absolutely take advantage or play through the cycle. So, so let's help ourselves. Let's create our own uh, tailwind. Let's create our own strength. And I think today, uh, if you are running a company, if you're a CFO company and you're waiting for things to get better, you're going to get crushed. So we've kind of learned not to necessarily predict the future, but to play through volatility, to use diversity as a strength, to create our own tailwind, and that's how we try to run our company. So we actually look at a time like 2016 with great promise. There's plenty of business out there to be had, and we march forward. So that's how I think about the company in this period of time. Uh, shift gears. I'm going to talk about three innovations that I think are really important to students or they're going to impact your career, things you might be interested in, in terms of what's going on in uh, the world today. And I'll start, because I'm in Paris, with uh, uh, the notion of a clean energy world. Right? And I would say that's been something that in 2004, as a company, 2005, we basically said as a company, uh, we think uh, climate science is real, climate change is real, it's created by man, that we weren't going to wait for public policy, we were going to invest accordingly as a company, but that we believe that innovation, we believe in economics, we also believe that you can solve big problems using innovation, and that you don't have to make necessarily uh, say that uh, every uh, solution has to be high cost, that you can basically change uh, the way uh, technology works and solve problems economically. We launched an initiative called Eco-Imagination. We're now in our 11th year, and this is uh, $34 billion of revenue. We're the biggest clean tech uh, company in the world. It was $5 billion in 2005. And the story I would tell you is really one of uh, not compromising, that basically continuing to drive the science so that you can create economic solutions. Uh, in 2004, the cost of electricity created by wind power was 30 cents a kilowatt hour, 30 American cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, today, it's 5 cents a kilowatt hour. And so what we did is applied innovation to low-cost solutions uh, for our customers, for the countries we do business in. And so the first message I would give you is that uh, it's important that we solve big global issues that innovation is an important bridge to solve big global issues. But we don't do anybody uh, any favors if we make these solutions precious or elite. That the solutions have to be low cost. That they have to be able to be just as relevant in China as they are in Paris. And that uh, as companies, uh, if you can drive innovation, if you can pick these big themes, uh, you can earn a profit at the same time. So clean energy is really about economic innovation delivered broadly to various industries, and that's the only way we can continue to make progress. So it's nice when groups meet in Paris. It's nice that they reached an accord. But really, the way that climate science is going to be solved is by uh, laboratories, entrepreneurs, big companies driving costs down and applying them broadly around the world. A second big innovation I would talk about is the advent of new material science and new manufacturing. This is changing dramatically around the world. Uh, manufacturing for years 
I would say, was less competitive uh, in the developed world. People uh, chased uh, different labor costs and things like that. Today, manufacturing is really about materials. <coughs> it's about advanced composites. It's about, it's about new coatings. It's about ways to make high-strength, lightweight products better and using them in new manufacturing technologies like 3D printing, uh, like uh, 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 new additive technologies, like new coding technologies. Uh, when I graduated from business school in 1982, no, none of my classmates wanted to work in manufacturing. Uh, Ten years ago, none of you wanted to work in manufacturing. Uh, Fifteen years ago, nobody. You thought it was dirty, grungy, uh, career killers. Now, manufacturing is actually quite cool. It's quite interesting. Uh, it's the key differentiation on how you make a jet engine, how you make a gas turbine. You can bring innovative technologies to any place in France or any place in Germany or any place in the US and make it as competitive as any place in the world. And so I, I've, I've seen this iteration of uh, manufacturing and manufacturing technology uh, really change as being a huge innovation and a place, again, that GE wants to lead. And the third big innovation I would talk about is, uh, is just the uh, focus of analytics and software around industrial products, what's called the industrial internet. And I guarantee you it's going to shape everybody in this uh, room's uh, careers in some way, shape, or form. So we've all seen what the consumer internet has done. It's transformed the way people shop, the way people watch uh, media, every, almost every industry in the consumer space. And that's taken place largely over the last 10 or 15 years. And today, uh, all of the industrial products that G makes are surrounded by sensors. So let's say a jet engine has got maybe 30 sensors on every jet engine. A flight from Paris to uh, London or Paris to New York City might take uh, a couple terabytes of data collected off these products. Uh, that is data on the heat of the engine, the fuel consumption, what uh, altitude it flow, flew at, uh, optimum space, where of the product, what the difference was between taking off at Charles de Gaulle Airport versus Heathrow, right? What's the advantage? And that data can be modeled. And if we can save one percentage of fuel uh, for all of the global uh, airline customers, that's worth $3 billion of profit. So small changes drive massive economic benefits. So there's trillions of dollars of productivity available for uh, people in the world. Uh, this is going to be done by big companies and small companies. What makes the industrial internet different than the consumer internet? When I get sick of this, I throw it away and buy a new one. You don't do that with a jet engine or an MR scanner, right? So you've got a huge installed base. You've got massive uh, data challenges in terms of size of data. You've got massive security challenges. And so there's going to be a combination of big companies and small companies. Do There's fundamentally four consumer platforms that have won. Uh, in the industrial space, there might be 24. There's going to be more than, you know, Facebook, Google. You've, you've got a very consolidated. It's going to be different in the industrial space. But, you know, we as a company are going to invest more than a billion dollars a year to build a platform, to build apps. We've got an open architecture that allows our customers or uh, at people in the ecosystem to write applications. We're at maybe $6 billion of revenue in the industrial internet. We think this is going to be 15 or $20 billion by 2020. So we're going to play just like any other small startup or any other Amazon in the industrial world because we feel, feel like we have to. This is absolutely critical for the future. So innovation continues. Clean tech, manufacturing, industrial internet. It's amazing what's going on in the world. It's going to shape everybody in, in his uh, career. So a uh, couple other comments. Um, what do I think about leading a big company? I, uh, GE is uh, eight divisions, eight businesses, 310,000 people, 175 countries, right, in a complicated world. You can only uh, manage uh, a, a complicated company in a complicated world through simplification. Uh, you can't do it through layers of management and, and layers of complexity. So when I think about leading GE today, uh, we're taking out management layers, we're, we're removing processes. Uh, GE has a reputation for being well managed. In the world we live in today, we have too much management. We, we have to lean out uh, 
uh, the way we think about it, more empowerment, more delegation of authority, uh, lean management is critical in the world we live in today. We have to simplify our world. Uh, data and transparency, right? We have to make sure that all the data that I can look at, somebody in the front lines can look at the same data. Uh, no PowerPoint charts, uh, every, everything based on updated uh, data and analytics, being able to look at cockpits the same way to make the right decisions at the right time. Uh, mark, uh, basic rule in G, market rule, right? That basically, uh, the, the only truth is known in the marketplace. Uh, there's no truth that gets, uh, uh, it doesn't do any good to have the world's best finance function or the world's best legal function. It doesn't matter. All that matters is market integrity, market truth. So I uh, believe in that way and speed about everything. We've basically, if you're a G executive, you've been doing lean manufacturing for 30 years. Uh, we now have applied that to more Silicon Valley rules and what we call fast works. So we're all about testing things, pivoting, uh, being faster in what we do. So if you say, what is good management today? Simplification, less structure, more data, more speed, market rules. That's how we run the place. Uh, last point before I take questions. Uh, careers. Your career is going to comp be comprised of three things. Uh, your experiences, right? So experience matters. Uh, and so if you want to uh, go do a startup, go do a startup. If you want to work for a company, work for a company. But get out there, get going, get experience, get self-confidence. So uh, uh, your career matters, right? Places you do. How well trained you are. So you're learning if you're a student. Um, you'll never know less than you know today. Uh, the advantage of my career is I, I've, I've been lucky, one of the lucky people that have had a chance to learn something new every day of my business career. So I'm blessed in that way. You know, the day I got out of business school, I thought I was smart, I really wasn't, but I had the chance to learn something new every day. That is awesome, if you can do that. And then personal traits. So if you look at my career, and if I look at who's been successful, here's what they have in common. They're competitive, ultra competitive. Ultra competitive, right? They learn, they're curious about everything. They, they're always asking more questions than they answer. They have the right combination of self-awareness and self-confidence, right? If you're self-aware and not self-confident, you never get anything done. And if you're self-confident and not self-aware, you're a jerk, right? Nobody wants to work with you. <laughs> so you have to have the right combination of those two things. Resiliency, right? The great philosopher uh, Mike Tyson once said, right? <laughs> everybody, everybody has a strategy until they get punched in the nose. Uh, business is a lot like that. You get punched in the nose a lot in business. And the ability to kind of see your way through that. Judgment matters. Judgment matters. You know, I know some people that I've worked with for 30 years. I would never let them make an important decision just because they just don't have the right you know, sense for things. Uh, the ability to stand apart. You'd be surprised how important it is to be willing to stand away from the crowd. To just say, look, I, I, today we're going to do it my way. I don't care. Uh, and, and that's very rare in big groups and in critical. And then ultimately, I think in the world you live in today, and maybe most importantly, even in a company like GE, is you've got to be a giver and not a taker. Uh, really, uh, your peers promote you. You know, your boss kind of has to like you. And the people that work for you kind of have to like you. You're, you're mutually dependent, right? But your peers are the ones that ultimately uh, determine uh, how fast you go. So, volatile world. Three big innovations. I, I think that is the awesome part about business is it just regenerates itself all the time. Uh, we think we can play in every innovation, right? What, you know, when I, when I address G team, I kind of say, why not us? Why, why, why can't we do the industrial internet? Why can't we do clean tech? Why not us, right? That's, that's important. Uh, uh, really simplification is the management mantra of the 21st century because in a volatile world, you've got to keep it simple. And think about your own personal traits. Uh, my HR leader thinks she can uh, train anybody to do anything. She's wrong, right? Sometimes you just have to find it inside yourself uh, to create the kind of person that you want to be, and it's never too late to change. Let me stop there and, and take uh, questions uh, from anybody. Shall I stay, stay here or sit? Uh, great. great. Good. 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 Thank you so much. It's, uh...
very, ref very refreshing uh, masterclass, honestly. And uh, I agree with you so much that uh, judgment matters. And of course, uh, a very big quality is discerning. Discerning the obvious and ha also seeing where the dotted lines are. And the challenge for our business schools is precisely not to accumulate the knowledge of yesterday, but eye-opening for tomorrow with cultural sensitivity. I'd like our two students to um, uh, come here because they're going to be uh, challenging and uh, asking questions. Uh, this is another Clara. <laughs> and Liu. Maybe you can sit next to... Uh, And uh, I'm sure you're happy to have an exchange. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought they were reporters. I was no, afraid no, they were no, taking no, notes. No, 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 they're reporters. But they're reporters for management, maybe. Oh, gosh. Good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, nice to meet you, Mr. L. Um, I'm a student of M1 at ESP Europe. So, uh, I. Uh, remember that you mentioned you like worked in GE for a consecutive 33 years. So uh, for now they graduate, uh, do you think it's uh, you no know, acceptable or good way to consider your career path to you know stay in one company for a relatively very long time? You know it wasn't my plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> my plan was I so I was going to business school. And I worked uh, the summer of 1981 at the Boston Consulting Group, you know, and I, I um, just to see what consulting was like. I wanted to, I wanted to get an experience, and I thought doing it in the summer. And I really had a great experience, but I, it wasn't for me. And I wanted to be a manager, you know, I wanted to go to work in business, and I wanted to be a manager. I didn't really see myself uh, as an investment banker or a consultant. So I said, you know, G had a good reputation for management, which hopefully we still do. And I, I thought I'd stay five years uh, and see what happened. And that was 33 years ago. So I, I didn't have a master plan, really. And, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I, I think you all need to build your own career. I don't think it's, you know, all of you don't have to go to work for the same company for your whole career. Some of you will. Uh, some of you will have 20 jobs, right, and, and do different things. So I think you just have to see, are you still growing and are you still learning? I, I thought about leaving uh, GE maybe twice in my career. I, I, I took interviews outside the company, but it was really because at that point, you know, my boss was a jerk, really. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that work was too hard or anything like that. It was like, it was mind numbing. I, I, you know, it, was, it wasn't interesting, it wasn't fun. And what I saw when I uh, took interviews I didn't like the people as much as I like. Even though I didn't like my boss, I liked the people I worked with. And so that's what always made me come back to GE was, so that's why it's always been important for me in GE is to get rid of as many jerks as I could, right? And to make sure that the environment was always one where people felt like they want, good people felt like they wanted to be a part of it. So a five-year plan turned out to be a 35-year plan but I never really thought about it with that amount of vision, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Um, I have a question about GE's recent investment in France. So why did you choose to uh, buy Alstom Energy and do you think France is still attractive for investors? So we have a long history in uh, France and in Europe as a company. And in the last 35 years, we've, we've partnered or acquired eight state-owned enterprises, uh, historically state-owned enterprises in Europe. So this is over a long, uh, extremely long period of time. So if you think about France, in, in the early 1970s, uh, we did a joint venture with the state-owned uh, aircraft, uh, 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 so what's called Safran today, uh, Snack or Snackma, and the joint venture was called CFM, and that was almost more than 40 years old. And then in my career, I, I ran our healthcare business. And in the 1980s, we swapped our television business with Thompson, French company, and received their healthcare business in return. So this was in the 1980s. So I had great hands-on experience in, in France. 
uh, uh, of doing uh, business. So that's that's that was the background. So we knew Alstom for decades. You know, we're in the industry. Uh, we we studied the company. We knew the company. And when uh, Alstom became uh, available, so it's one of those things you would never do anything hostile. We don't do hostile things anyhow. So, but when they were put themselves in play, we decided that that would be a good uh, a good opportunity. And so that that's how the process started. And look, it had many twists and turns as we went through the process. So it was uh, it was slightly more interesting than we had thought at the time. But but nonetheless, it. it uh, it came through. So we knew the industry well. We knew the company. We felt like there could be some good growth opportunities. And, and then what, what I would say about France in particular and Europe in general is, are the people, uh, the engineering talent, the, the fundamental productivity in France is quite high. And we have great self-confidence in this as... Uh, uh, a way to generate good competitive businesses. So uh, we have a lot of confidence in the people and in the fundamental ability to make high-tech products in France is excellent. And so when I think about an investment like, like uh, Alstom, we invest in the people and we invest in the ability to take uh, capability in France and export it around the world. If the European market gets better someday, for electricity or for power, we kind of get that for free. We don't underwrite that in the base case. We kind of assume, look, the markets as we see them today are gonna to continue as we see them today, but we can build a competitive enterprise with the people selling to the global market. So uh, we're, we were experienced. Um, I think we know how to get the best out of our uh, French teams, our European teams. I think, I think our people in, uh, you know, in, in this case, in the case of Alstom, our best allies were the production workers in Belfort. They were our best allies because they had seen us for 10 or 15 years. We lived up to what we said we were going to do, and that, that's what made it, made it uh, possible. So that's, uh, that's how we thought about it. But it was, I've always said I was never going to write a book, a business book. But if I were going to write one, this would be a chapter. There would be a, <laughs> Alston would definitely be a, uh, it would be a good, well, maybe a whole book, but who knows. But it was an interesting process. Right. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Melt. Uh, I have another question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you would like to transform GE into a more simpler and more like industrial focused company. And to facilitate this transformation period, um, would GE consider to seek help from like, third party companies like consulting companies or it would be an internal process? Thanks. So we always, um, you know, really it's, uh, uh, I think we've got good people inside the company, but we always uh, want to get outside views. We, we, we always want to get uh, new perspectives and things like that because you get, you get trapped in companies and it takes, uh, it takes conflicting points of view. It takes contrarian points of view to be, uh, to be effective. Um, you know, running a company is, it requires multiple personalities. So on one hand, um, you can never be afraid enough. You can never be scared enough. So you have to be completely paranoid about everything. You, you, you have to be like, oh my God, give me the worst case. Give me, what happens if this? And so you have to be like completely <coughs> paranoid. And at the same time, you have to be supremely self-confident. So you have to go from being completely paranoid to being supremely self-confident in the matter of five minutes. <laughs> so in many ways, good people are their own worst critic. And I'm a critic of everything I do all the time. And, and leadership, in some ways, is this intense journey into yourself of self-learning, self-renewal, self-confidence. How much are you willing to give? How much are you willing to tear yourself down? How much are you willing to take? And I, I always tell people, like, I, I go to bed every night and look in the mirror and say, you're a complete failure. You screwed up everything today. And you wake up the next morning shaving and say, you are awesome. 
you are, you are so handsome. You know, how did you ever do this? How did you, how, how can anybody be that good, you know? But you have to be, so it takes, it takes external criticism to be scared enough to say, did you think about this? Did you think about that? So, so we use uh, bankers, consultants, uh, all kinds of third parties to give us good advice on things that we can do. And then the trick is we don't listen to all of them, but we let it kind of swim through our head. You know, We're open to hearing it, but sometimes somebody will be giving me a long presentation, I'll get halfway through and just, I'll start daydreaming, because I'll say, listen, it's good they came in. They had one good idea. That was on page two. We're on page 22. <laughs> the rest of it's going to be BS. Let's just, let's just get ready for it, right? So it's just a, you have to, you have to be a good filter as well. I, you know, I think it's the digital stuff, right? Um, a lot of you want to be entrepreneurs. I encourage it. I think it's awesome. But not every idea is a good idea. You know, in other words, uh, I think as the world unfolds, you sit back and you say, I know the, the first time uh, I used Google, I said, hey, that's a great search. <laughs> it's an awesome idea. Now, in order to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to combine a good idea with the ability to make money. And I always say, I've never seen a company do what Google's done in the last 10 or 15 years of taking a good idea turn it into a successful business model. I'm amazed by those guys. But for every Google, there are 100 that either weren't a good idea or had no way to make money. And that's why you can't always listen to, you know, you have to be discerning about what works for, what works for you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. What um, was your question again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about the three big tendencies in your business now, um, especially the industrial internet. How do you think this tendency will change your company culture and how your company culture should maybe adapt? To yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. So she's a you know, 100 plus year old industrial company. The fact is, is that um, every industry, every company is just going to be broadly digitized. And in some ways, this is just beginning. And it's going to go from the way that you do work internally. So I, I think, you know, even though people like GE have been, uh, you know, purveyors of information technology, big customers of Oracle and Microsoft, we're just scratching the surface from, from the standpoint of how our own workflow is going to be digitized. Our, our customer relationships are going to be broadly uh, you know, different. You know, I, uh, uh, Air France is a big customer. Total is a big customer. Um, uh, our relationships with them are going to be digitized from a standpoint of how our assets work in their installed base. Uh, we're going to have to do more uh, outcomes risk, right? So uh, a company like Air France may not buy engines. What they might buy is power by the hour. How much uptime? So you've got to really transform your business model, your technology. And then culturally, um, look, when we make investments on the industrial internet, uh, maybe I can bring a third of the existing GE team with me in this initiative, but we're going to have to go out and hire thousands of people uh, uh, from the outside uh, that are going to become part of GE. We're already well on the way to do that. And then the last thing, this is the hardest thing for particularly in industrial companies, which is, you know, we're a company that grew up on closed systems. You know, we own this technology around this jet engine, and it is a, it's protected by patents, and it's a closed system. Uh, the internet's all about open ecosystems. So our platform, so we, we're gonna, we, we've built, unlike most of our competitors, we've built an industrial cloud-based, industrial strength cloud-based, analytical operating system called Predix. And it's open. And it's uh, basically, it's open to our competitors, it's open to our customers, and it's open to us, right? If you had told me five years ago, we would be doing something that would be uh, welcoming of Siemens assets or things like that, I would say, you are crazy. So I, I think, but I come back to market's role. 
no matter where you go to work, uh, if you don't, if you're not willing to follow your market, your customers, no matter where they go, you'll be out of business uh, at some point in time. So I ver very much have grown up with the philosophy that markets, uh, that, that markets rule, and that you, you, you can only be a good judge of anything uh, when you're on the ground, when you're actually in the market, in, you know, trying things, learning things. And so I have a, a high appetite for that, even though some of the things we're, we're going to do are going to fail as we go through it. I think we have to learn that and change quickly. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So in your speech, you mentioned that the importance of like standing apart, right? So in everyday life, sometimes we may encounter peer pressure. So can you possibly share some personal experience concerning this part? Maybe some little stories with you and your former boss, this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, my, so my first, um, so I, uh, you know, I joined GE and I, one of my first management jobs, maybe my first manager job is I was a, I was a field sales manager, right? So I had the southwestern part of the United States to sell plastic uh, to molders. And my boss came and this was, these were the days when manufacturing facilities were uh, just beginning to go into northern Mexico, what's called Maquilador. And I said to my boss, uh, his name was Pat Bays, I said, Pat, if you gave me $50,000, I can put a warehouse in place in El Paso and I'll never lose an order. Okay, but you have to give me 50,000 bucks. And we talk, we're dri I'm driving a Taurus, you know, or some, you know, some car, and he's sitting next to me, and I'm saying, I had a piece of paper, you know, $50,000, I'll pay it back in seven months, and he's saying, ah, you know, this is bullshit, we're not going to do that, you know, stuff like that. And finally he says, take me to the airport, he says, okay, let's do it. And that was my first promotion. That was standing apart as a, somebody in their late 20s. Uh, flash forward in 2004, when we decided to launch a clean energy initiative in GE, uh, now I'm CEO, okay? So that was when I was a sales manager. Now I'm CEO. And we had studied a period of time. We had had people studying science. Now, at this point in time, you know, like in many big companies, you know, GE uh, had super fun sites in the U.S. Uh, we, had, we had all kinds of environmental pressure in the company. And I came to a group like this of 30 executives and said, guess what, team? Uh, we're going to launch a clean energy initiative and 29 people looked at me and they didn't say this but they said you are crazy we're not going to do this <laughs> this is not this is not what GE does and I said no no just trust me do it my way right like most times when you're boss you basically just play with the team but about three times every year you have to say hey I have a really good idea today let's do it my way uh, if you never say that nothing ever happens and if you always say that, nobody good's ever going to want to work for you, right? <laughs> but you have to pick the times you say that. So that's how momentum starts. Now, it's easier to stand apart when you're CEO than when you're a district sales manager, I, I admit. But occasionally, that's how change happens. And I think it's, uh, what, what's your biggest advantage um, by going to ESCP? Uh, what's, your, what's your single biggest advantage? Right? You got to think about that. Now, I'm sure you're smart or else you wouldn't be here, right? I'm sure you're smart. And I'm sure you've learned a lot, an amazing amount while you've been here. But the biggest advantage you have with this degree is you know you can get another job. You, you know you can get another job, right? Am I right? So don't be afraid. And if you're not afraid, you can stand apart. And if you stand apart, by the way, you get more noticed in a big company than you do a small company. Because most of the people in the big company aren't going to stand apart, right? So use your degree as the foundation on which you can stand apart because you know you can get another job, right? Yes, thank you. Um, maybe a broader question now. Uh, what is your uh, global vision for GE and where do you see the company in five or 10 years? So globally, uh, you know, really, I would say my generation of the company has been very aggressive globalizers. You know, we've kind of grown up on a, in a global world, so we're not really afraid of new markets. 
And I, I would say that the biggest thing is I want us to be present every place in the world where we're allowed to be present. So one, one just has to do with just sheer mass. But I think what's more important about globalization today that's really important for the people in this room is that there's, in some ways, there's no such thing, you know? In other words, I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm an American CEO who's worked for the last 30 plus years. I'm a free market capitalist, right? I believe in open borders. I believe that everybody should be able to sell things every place in the world. That's not the most accepted view today. In, in the days of higher, more populism, uh, globalization is quite difficult today. And so inside our company, uh, we really have built the ability to be more local. Uh, we're more nuanced today. We know the difference between France and Germany, right? We don't just talk about it as Europe. We know the difference between doing business in Beijing and doing business in Tianjin or doing business in uh, Chengdu, right? So I, my vision of globalization is one of being a highly effective local company uh, that is able to get the best out of our scale but has a very local face in everything we do. And I just think that's the state of, uh, that's the state of play. We might like globalization in this room, but none of our friends like globalization. Uh, most of the citizens outside the doors here don't like uh, globalization. And so what we have to be able to do is put a very local uh, face on everything we do. And that, I think, is going to be your world uh, more than uh, the easy days of globalization are over. And we're going to be in a much more difficult uh, global market going forward in the future. All that being said, you know, we have, we have a business team today that is uh, extremely global. You know, if you went to do a, a GE review of Sub-Saharan Africa, most of our leaders are from Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, they've lived around the world. They've lived in the U.S. or London or Paris or places like that. But they're an extremely local uh, team, and we like, we like it that way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that we are now in the world of volatilities, and that may require a lot of mergers and acquisition um, as G, a big company. So can you comment on that? On M&A in, in general? Yeah, yeah, the general circumstances. Oh, look, I mean, I Thanks. think um, uh, in a slow growth world with relatively low interest rates, uh, M&A is easier to do, let's say, financially. Uh, mm -hmm. But M&A is quite hard. Um, most deals don't work. So you need to be pretty humble about uh, doing acquisitions, how hard they are, uh, how best to integrate. And, you know, for instance, in, uh, in the case of Alstom, Mark Hutchinson, uh, you know, he's one of our most senior leaders uh, that has led the integration effort, you know. So he's directly connected to me. He's somebody that's lived around the world, extremely experienced, and so I, I, I think in some ways um, uh, people underestimate how challenging real value creation from mergers and acquisitions really are. So we, you know, kind of the core underlying philosophy of, the, of our company is to be good at organic growth and do M&A uh, because we can, not because we have to. And I think that's the uh, that's the right way to think about uh, that's the right way to think about M and A. And if you can't grow something really in the end, if you're not able to, w whether you're a drug company, or an industrial company, or an oil and gas company, or a media company, if if after the merged companies come together, you can't grow it organically, it's a failure. It is going to fail, right? That there there is. There is never a way to get enough sustainable value out of just merging infrastructures or inverting tax codes or things like that. If when the dust settles, you can't grow it, it's a, it's a bad deal. So I, I think that's, you know, it's, 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 they're juicy media stories. So if you picked up the FT or the Wall Street Journal, something like that, you're going to read all about, all about M&A. 
but the underlying core organic growth is always what differentiates, uh, always what differentiates uh, company. You know, Apple, awesome what they've done. They made more money in the fourth quarter of 2015 uh, than any company in history. I'm amazed by that. What do investors care the most about? The growth of the iPhones, <laughs> you know. So it's always, it's always in the end gets back to uh, organic growth. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Maybe we get uh, to the last question, if you'd like, Clara. Okay, Very perfect. Um, so there are many students in this room, and as you know, today young people are a lot more attracted to startups and flexibility at work than before. How do you plan to deal with this and to attract them to a big company like GE? So, I mean, you know, in the end, we are who we are, right? So in the end, we, we um, you know, our task is, I don't know how many people... Uh, fly in an airplane, have flown an airplane, everybody, right? Um, so we make those engines. So when you, let's say you're on an Air France flight, you're at 35,000 feet, you're looking at, out at this engine that is a miracle, and the engine's 20 years old. You probably want to think that somebody that actually built that engine still works at GE, <laughs> probably, right? So we need to have a culture that on one hand accommodates the nature of our technology and the nature of the long, you know, the high technology, long lived, high performance assets. So one end of our culture has to accommodate that. And the other end of the culture has to accommodate, uh, we want people that want to work at startups. We want people that want to uh, try new things. So. We have to be broad enough and flexible enough as a company to go from people who want this individualized uh, uh, world all the way to those people that want to work on an engineering team to make this miracle of flight. And we try to do both. So, so we try to do it. Now, I think what I've reconciled myself to is... Uh, maybe when I was getting, getting out of school, 95% of you would have thought about working at GE. Maybe today it's not that. Maybe it's 60%. So what we have to do is we have to get you in your third job. We, we, we have to be constantly launching new ideas and new businesses that get you in your third. We can't give up on you. I refuse to give up on you. But if I'm not attracting enough to you now, maybe I will be someday. I get better looking every day, right? <laughs> so, so when, uh, if you go to, so our, our industrial internet uh, facility in California has roughly 2,000 people, most of them new to GE. The median age would be in the early 30s. Most of the people there are in their third or fourth job. I'm cool with that, really. You know, I, I think it's up to us to keep you. Once you, once you come to our company, it's up to us to keep you. Uh, and we have to constantly be evolving uh, to, to be attractive to you. But never forget, one of the other ways that I, we can distinguish ourselves is we have to make really great high-performance assets that Total want to buy or Air France wants to buy. And we have to be attractive to, you know, long-standing mechanical engineers, material engineers, and material scientists. That's our challenge. That's our challenge. And we can't give up on either end of the spectrum. Thank you very Thanks. much. Great. Now, <laughs> Professor Imelt. There are many certainties. <laughs> Believe me, it's not one book you must write, but volumes. And uh, thank you for these very authentic uh, messages, this next generation of leaders. And I'd like a standing ovation for these uh, extraordinary messages you've been sharing with us. And I'd be happy to have your uh, VP for Europe and France maybe come here and make a photo with our students of ESCP Europe the Dean of Faculty also, and President Gunnell, if you please. Extraordinary messages.
Now this community is yours. <laughs>